Hello there, good evening to you. A very warm welcome again to Coast to Coast. In tonight's programme, we tune in to the transistor radio that's upset the Performing Rights Society. You see, they want it silenced. We also look at the latest book on the Falklands War. It's absolutely scathing about both sides. And we get a taste of the high life with singer Vince Hill at home beside the Thames. But first, a businessman from High Eath in Hampshire couldn't believe his luck when he opened the post. In it was a cheque from British Telecom for nearly £200,000. So, were the gods really smiling on him, or was it a mistake? Peter Clark has the answer. Managing director Terry McKnight was both shocked and amused when the cheque dropped through the letterbox of his electronics components company that makes quartz crystals for watches. Nobody but nobody owed him anything like even 10% of this figure, let alone British Telecom. But yes, British Telecom were in his company's debt to the tune of £11.50. It was for a recent order. Mr McKnight promptly wrote to British Telecom saying he could not trace an invoice for precisely the £192,580.60 that they'd sent him and that in his view there was, well, an error. Meanwhile, his office deposited the cheque in his bank. Mr McKnight explained to me that he had no option but to do this and wait for it to be cleared so that his office could safely send British Telecom the difference between that and what they actually owed him. But whose cheque is it and why was it sent to Mr McKnight? Simple, really. British Telecom rang him this afternoon to point out that the computer had accidentally paid the wrong man. The other chap will be getting his cheque post-haste. Meanwhile, Mr McKnight is making sure British Telecom get their money back from him. It's being returned tonight by second-class post. At £90 interest a day, British Telecom's boob will have netted Mr McKnight £400. Mr McKnight, who reckons there is at last something to say for our second-class postal system, has come to the end of his five-day flirt with fortune. Good old British Telecom. Now, the dustman in Basingstoke uh, came out on strike today. It was over the sacking of a colleague for working too slowly. But, as Robin Marriage now reports, it's the latest episode in a saga that started back in June this year. It was in June the council decided to privatise the district's dustbins. The men said that would mean redundancies and staged a one-day protest strike. There aren't so many strikers this time outside the Wade Road depot because those predictions came true. As a result, the men say they've got to work twice as hard, and that's just not possible. In ones and twos, they've been sacked for working too slowly. Yesterday was the last straw. Transport Union McHillier was fired. Very, very solid. We're expected to run eight hours a day, five days a week and more. That sounds, uh, if I may say so, a bit of an exaggeration. No, it's not. It's not. It's, they're, they're asking us to run, literally to run. That's the amount of work that we've got to cover. The company say they know their business, and similar targets are met with ease in other towns. The men say the sprawl that is Basingstoke is not equalled anywhere. Union re representative Chris Oldacre says he's had threatening phone calls. Whereas before, they had um, 20 rounds of five men on each team. They're now working it with 12 rounds and four men. So each man has got to do twice as much work in one day for the same amount of, well, less pay. Because everyone here who worked on the council before are taking home at least £50 a week less. This afternoon, the strike was being made official, but it could be some time before the dustmen of Basingstoke know whether their days at the double are over. The police have launched a murder inquiry after a man's body was found floating in a river at Reading. The body of the middle-aged man was found in the Hollybrook, just 200 yards from Reading Police Station. It was discovered by a member of staff from a nearby Salvation Army hostel. At first, it was thought he'd fallen, but he was later found to have suffered more serious head injuries. A helicopter pilot from Basingstoke was killed this afternoon when his machine crashed during a flying display at Ledbury in Herefordshire. Eyewitnesses said the helicopter's rotor blades struck the ground during a turn. It then crashed in flames, giving the pilot no chance of escape. He's not yet been named. Two postal workers were held at gunpoint outside a sub-post office at Bracknell. They were threatened by two masked men on the Great Holland's estate, carrying a sawn-off shotgun. After seizing two mailbags, the men fled in a stolen car, which was later found abandoned nearby. 
The student midwife from Portsmouth, who's been missing since Sunday, has turned up safe and well. Angela Macklin was said to have been dragged screaming from her room at St Mary's Hospital Nurses Home by an ex-boyfriend. A man has now been charged with criminal damage and will appear in court at Portsmouth tomorrow. A first-class row has erupted at Christchurch in Dorset and it's all over a harmless, run-of-the-mill transistor radio. The set in question is really just part of the scenery at a motor engineering workshop there, but the company's now threatened with legal action in the High Court unless they turn it off. Steve Harris now reports. It may look like any cheap old transistor radio blaring out Radio 1, but it isn't. Nor does Fred Jester's motor engineering workshop in Airfield Road look like the Festival Hall or any other place of public entertainment and enjoyment for that matter. But in the eyes and ears of the Performing Rights Society, Mr Jesty and his four mechanics are breaking the law by giving an unlicensed public performance. And what upsets Mr Jesty most, apart from the fact that he absolutely loathes Radio 1, is the way in which the PRS uncovered his crime. I was angry because I disliked snooping and the only way they could have found that we had a Radio 1 in our workshop was to snoop. Now, when you put it to them that they'd snooped, that they'd, they'd come onto your premises without your permission, what was their reaction? They claimed that uh, if they didn't snoop, how on earth were they going to find out we were using a radio? But their claim is also based on the fact that to pay this licence, you should be performing to the public. Are you performing to the public in any way? No, no. The public are expressly forbidden to enter our workshops, and the only people who can enter the workshops are the staff. So on what grounds are they now saying that you've got to pay a licence? They claim that for the purposes of this law, that my staff are public. And are they? No. <laughs> what is your general reaction to the principle behind this, that um, people working in workshops, not only your own, but hundreds, thousands throughout the country, will be liable to this sort of licence? I think the whole thing has very far-reaching effects. And I suppose, if I'm going to be honest, the the whole thing is pathetic. Pathetic is probably the best word for it all. And do you have any intention of paying up the 30 or 40 pounds they suggest you pay? Well, I hope not. But if the law says I have to, then I would be breaking a law which I wouldn't wish to do. But to pay this money to this society, for them to give to what they call cases of hardship in the performing industry, would mean that I'm subsidizing people that the public don't want to pay to see anyway. Those that are paid are paid far too much, and those that aren't paid, nobody wants to see. So I don't see why we should subsidise those. A spokesman for the Performing Rights Society said any use of a radio in a public place outside the home was a breach of the 1956 Copyright Act. He added that he resented the use of the word snooping and pointed out that his society sent out 30,000 letters a year to people like Mr Jesty who were unaware of the law. A call to end the two-week dog strike at Southampton is expected at tonight's regular union meeting. So far, only one man out of the 1,100 workers has regularly crossed picket lines. But last week, a group of dockers showed a change of heart by drawing up a petition. They say they're concerned about the effect on the port by a long strike. The converted trawler, which will carry hundreds of teenagers on a voyage of a lifetime, docked in Southampton today, just four days before it sets off around the world on Operation Raleigh. As the trip's scheduled to last four years, the people who are sailing the Sir Walter Raleigh are making sure she's fully shipshape. As she goes around the world, the ship will pick up at various stages some 4,000 passengers who will take part in 40 different expeditions. Plans to extend the Royal Berkshire Industrial Estate at Thatcham near Newbury could mean up to 400 new jobs in the area. It's hoped the site will become a food distribution depot supplying the Marks and Spencer chain. Police are still investigating an American church based in Brighton called Fill the Gap, whose beliefs include natural childbirth. It follows the death of a nine-day-old Rebecca Cons, who was delivered at home by her parents, who are both members of the church. Rebecca died in hospital from breathing problems. Today, one of the church's ministers said the devil was responsible for her death. Nick Hudson spoke to the minister. We're faith teachers. We teach faith in God. That uh, if your faith can develop, that you can believe God to have uh, your baby at home, then uh, fine. That's, what, that's one of God's promises, that, that he will uh, sustain you, that he's the healer. He's our healer uh, completely. 
And uh, if uh, this is something between a person and his wife, a husband and his wife, it's not something that I would uh, tell anyone that they have to do it. But if they would come to me and say, uh, God has showed us that we're going to have our baby by natural childbirth at home, I'd say praise the Lord because it shows that their faith has been strengthened in God, that they can believe God for this. But ne nevertheless, your church would encourage that view. Uh, I wouldn't say encourage. Uh, we encourage people to believe God, you know, if their faith is there. It, they are, we encourage them to do this. Uh, uh, just like, in not particular childbirth, it'd be the same thing. We believe the word says, oh, no man, uh, anything but to love him. So we don't uh, believe in borrowing money. Or you can go on down the line. It's... In view of what happened to Rebecca, do you think medical treatment at birth would have saved her? I don't think so. I don't, uh, I don't think. Uh, uh, I just really don't believe because I believe the parents, uh, they had the faith to uh, have the child at home on their own. Uh, I can't, I'm not a medical expert and, and I can't uh, uh, see uh, into the spirit to say why, why do you think she died? Uh, I really believe it's uh, just the, the door was open to the devil some way or another. I don't know. I'm not saying that the parents was wrong or anything else. I'm just saying that uh, Somehow or another, uh, we know the word says that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, you know, and God doesn't. And that was the reason you believe she died? I, I believe that. That's the reason I believe. I believe the, the door was open and the devil got in there somehow. More than 100,000 troops are heading for Germany this week for the biggest military operation in the West since D-Day. It's called Exercise Lionheart, and above all, it's going to be a big test for the part-time soldiers, the Territorial Army. Christopher Peacock's been taking a look at how they'll be lining up alongside the professionals. For half a century, the Soviet Communist Party, the government, and the people have been unstintingly concerned with the Army's welfare. The main reason for Exercise Lionheart is the sheer weight and size of the Soviet military machine. When it comes to morale and skill, Western troops are well able to match the East Europeans. But if it ever came to war, NATO's regular troops would be outnumbered by at least two to one. Some military experts believe that on their own, they would soon be overwhelmed, which is why Exercise Lionheart is so important. The main aim is to test how quickly the part-time Territorial Army, seen here training at Lipbrook in Hampshire, could mobilise and give them support. In the next week, 60,000 part-time reserve and regular soldiers will leave for the British sector of Germany around Hanover. Of those, about 30,000 will pass through the port of Dover, but harbour officials stress that ordinary ferry passengers will be able to leave as usual. In all, more than 100,000 British soldiers and airmen will take part, making this the biggest military exercise in the West since the D-Day landings of 40 years ago. A few have already been to the battlefront. Royal Engineers from Kent were part of an advance party with one of the most hair-raising jobs of all, disposing of enemy mines. They're now followed by five Queens, an artillery battalion based at Canterbury. They'll be defending a strategically important stretch of forest in West Germany. Every war needs an enemy, and that's provided by the so-called Orange Forces of two Wessex, based at Reading, but also taking recruits from Hampshire and parts of Sussex. Their job is to prevent the rest of our troops from reaching their destination. The TAs are keen to lose their image among some people as overgrown Boy Scouts. But if history repeats itself, they could succeed at a cost. During the last exercise of this type four years ago, one soldier died and countless others were injured. The army says that more casualties are inevitable during Exercise Lionheart. And we'll, of course, keep you up to date with the progress of Exercise Lionheart during the next fortnight. Now, a question for you. What would you think these people have in common? Linda McCartney, Spike Milligan, Julie Christie, Dame Anna Neagle, the singer Peter Gabriel? Well, apart from show business, of course, Fred has the answer. Well, the answer is those illustrious people all share a love of animals and a strict vegetarian diet. Animal Aid is an organisation that can count on their support in a campaign they're running this month to promote vegetarian food and a totally meat-free diet. To explain all, organiser for Animal Aid, Mark Gold, 
and vegetarian cookery teacher and writer Celia Storey from Chichester. Welcome to you both. Mark, first of all, the idea of the campaign, what is the idea and why should we become vegetarians, do you believe? I don't think there's a should about it. I think there's enormous public interest now in vegetarianism and there are two main reasons for that. Firstly, people have seen the many medical reports linking excess animal fat, with, um, particularly with heart disease and various other diseases. And secondly, I think the public are becoming sickened by what they hear about animal cruelty. Uh, they've heard a lot about factory farms, animals being overcrowded, uh, not being able to turn around, this kind of thing. Now we have a government report on slaughterhouses talking about animals being prodded by the genitals and anus and uh, hung upside down to have their throats that well still fully conscious. And I think there is uh, generally a revulsion against this. Fine. OK, so you've made your point, but Celia... The problem is, people always say it doesn't look very nice, it doesn't taste very nice. You would disagree with that? Absolutely, yes. Well, yeah. you've, you've produced a feast here for us to look at, so tell me what we've got. What is this to start with? Well, that's a vegetable au gratin. Um, instead of cauliflower au gratin, I've used a mixture of vegetables that I had in the garden. It looks pink because I've used a lot of beetroot in it and there are various other vegetables that and, I've put and in And that is nourishing sauce. and tasty? Yes, All yes, right. it is. These look rather nice. What are these? Well, they're rather fun. They're egg and mushroom croquettes. And uh, I break them open, I'll show you. And very, very tasty. They're good hot or cold. The children love them for in their lunch boxes. And what about housewives who say, oh, I haven't got time to do all this? Is it fairly easy to prepare or does it require Well, some of hours? it does take a while. It does take longer than just putting a lamb chop in the, in the oven. Mm. Um, but one what or a, two oh, things are quicker. Um, these are pita bread, which you can buy in the supermarket, and I make sandwiches out of those with a hummus, uh, which is made out of uh, chickpeas, and it's a lovely filling for it. Beef burgers, of course, are out, but soya burgers are in, and soya these are soya are burgers. Yes, but these are homemade soya burgers. I think you can buy them in the packet, but it's just so easy to make it yourself. That's a mixture of soya flour, um, ground nuts, and oats mixed up with a bit of water and a bit of um, flavouring, and that's it. You just fry them. Rather a tasty-looking loaf on the end there. Mm. Now, what is that? Well, I had to have some nuts in this. Everybody thinks that vegetarians live on nut roasts, but this is one. Um, they are absolutely delicious, but we don't live on them. There are so many other things to eat besides. Right. Let's come to the back of the table. We're now going to see you doing a bit of cookery. Yes. What have we got Well, here? I have here a lasagna. When I was in Venice, we had lasagna like this. It's rather like cannelloni with a mixture of um, cottage cheese and spinach rolled up in it and a sauce over the top. And of course, instead of meat, I've used lentils in the sauce and it's a lovely tomato sauce. That looks superb. It does look very nice it's, indeed. It's very tasty and I find that people who are vegetarians or not love this and quite honestly, the meat eaters don't even realize they haven't eaten any meat. Can I say to you both, I think you've almost convinced me. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Celia Storia was talking to Fred early today. You might like to know that Celia's brought out a book called Whole Food and Vegetarian Cookery. And while we're on the subject of cooking, there was a fine spread laid on at the show business home of singer Vince Hill today. He allowed our cameras into his Thameside mansion for a very special occasion. Edelweiss was the flower that gave Vince Hill one of his biggest selling records, but it's roses that bloom in the garden of his 1920s mock Tudor home near Henley. Vince Hill and his wife Annie moved here five years ago. It's the perfect retreat for one of Britain's most popular singers. They live hard by the Thames in that show business water belt, frequented by the likes of Bruce Forsyth, Jimmy Tarbuck and Michael Parkinson. The Hills aren't bothered by the noise of traffic from the road merely the occasional pleasure cruiser passing by their front garden. Vince Hill is one of those likeable show business people with family appeal. Rarely out of work, he's just completed a summer season at Bournemouth and is now recording a new country album. I wake up with this view every morning, the, the view up the river there towards Reading and that view down there towards Henley. It's just hardly a morning goes by without me waking up and saying, what a lucky chap I am. I just hope I can always afford to live here, that's all. <laughs> a patriotic man is Vince Hill, who has not followed other performers into tax exile, despite the rewards of his career. Today, he's sharing his home with an exhibition of British leisure craft, including a collection of fun glassware. There's masses to eat, and the view is quite splendid. I don't know. The bus parties have arrived with a sprinkling of the London designer set and Vince and Annie are there to meet them. 
It's an unusual gesture for a show business celebrity who is well aware of the risks of intrusion of privacy. Hello. How private is it for you? I mean, do you get pestered from people who knock on your front door and say, can I have your autograph, Vince? No. I don't know. They, they, they sing Edelweiss as they go past sing on the boat. Edelweiss, yeah, that some people do. If, if they recognise me, you know, in the garden, and let's face it, I, I'm not going to hide myself, but um, if I want to be private, there's plenty of room to be private here. You know, and people generally, I must say, don't make nuisances of themselves here. Not people on boats and things, they're, they're smashing. Today, it's roses as a thank you to the couple for hosting the exhibition. It's a gesture typical of Vince and Annie Hill, who have one of the happiest marriages in show business. They've just celebrated their silver wedding anniversary. The couple met when Annie was working for the impresario Tito Burns. Vince was looking for work. What he found was a wife. So what's the secret between Mr. and Mrs. Vince Hill? She why, beats me into submission <laughs> most of the time. I'm sweetness and light, what are you talking about? <laughs> Well, I think it's making uh, life fun. Make, trying to make life fun and trying to understand each other and being able to talk a lot to each other about things. Mm -hmm. Don't bottle things up and, and uh, travel and stay together as much as you can. In our early days, we stayed together, didn't we, a lot. I mean, well, we traveled before, for 12 before years our together. little boy was born. We traveled for 12 years everywhere together, and that's very important to stay together. The biggest uh, single cause, I think, of marriages breaking up in our business is the fact that people are drawn apart continually uh, for weeks and weeks and sometimes months on end. And that's no fun. But it was fun ending the day with a bottle of champagne. Well, if you get two at the same time, why not? Two pops for the price of one. <laughs> Vince Hill, a very nice man indeed. This, I suspect, is not quite so nice. You see, there have been quite a few books written about the Falklands conflict, but perhaps the most controversial of the lot is about to be published. It's innocently described as a storybook for adults, but the publishers are stealing themselves for many an angry phone call. So much so, in fact, they've just persuaded the book's author, Sussex artist Raymond Briggs, to go ex-directory. Steve MacDonald reports. <laughs> Once upon a time, down at the bottom of the world, there was a sad little island. Raymond Briggs, at his studio in Westminster near Brighton, has tackled some unlikely subjects over the years. A flying snowman, a grouchy Santa Claus, a bogeyman called Fungus. Right now, for a stage show next Christmas, it's a toad that talks. Briggs' books are bestsellers in about 15 languages, and just back from the printers is his latest the tin pot foreign general and the old iron woman. It's the most preposterous story of all, the most horrendous, and the only one based on fact. No one lived on the sad little island except for a few poor shepherds. These poor shepherds spent all their time counting their sheep and eating them. Next door to the sad little island, there was a great big kingdom ruled over by a wicked foreign general. You've written it as a fable. Do you think in a few generations' time there'll be people who won't actually believe this could have happened? Well, I'm sure they won't. Lots of us couldn't believe it was happening at the time. And it struck me that the whole thing was horribly like a folktale. You know, the wicked giants, one on each side, manipulating the little people whilst they sat in safety. Listen, far away over the sea, there lived an old woman with lots of money and guns. Like the tin pot foreign general, she wasn't real either. She was made of iron. Well, I don't think she's quite as bad as him. I don't think she's killed anybody, not directly anyway, which presumably he has. I had him with a bloodstained dagger and she hasn't got one. But uh, I don't think there's an awful lot to choose in the way they became more like one another as the war went on. Now this tin pot foreign general wanted to be important. So one day he got all his soldiers and all his guns and he put them into boats. Then he sailed them over the sea to the sad little island. He stamped ashore and bagsied the sad little island for his very own. Uh, Mia bagazio elilandio! I bags the island, he roared. 
Then the old iron woman got all her soldiers and guns, and she put them into her boats and sailed them over the sea to the sad little island. She wanted to bags you the sad little island back again, you see. Bang! 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 went the guns of the tin pot foreign general. Bang! 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 went the guns of the old iron woman. I think some people are going to be offended by it, I suppose, judging by the enthusiasm they showed for the war. Anyone who expresses a pacifist point of view is going to be fairly unpopular. After this, there was a grand parade to celebrate the great victory and everyone went to church and thanked God. What was really appalling was the enthusiasm that the British public showed for it. That really depressed me more than the war itself, in a way. Did you believe, as most Britons did, that there was a principle at stake at issue? No, I didn't think there was any principle at stake, really. I thought it was a war mainly about territory and about the vanity of the leaders on each side. And uh, all the tragedy flowed from that. Hundreds of brave men were killed, and they were all real men, made of flesh and blood. They weren't made of tin or of iron. Which, finally, is the bigger monster, Galtieri or Thatcher? Well, he's gone, but the, thing, the frightening thing about the Falklands was that she might apply the same attitude, I'm sure she would, to other wars and nuclear wars, if she goes on these matters of principle feeling that she's dead right and therefore can do no wrong. If she applies that in other fields, we've all had it. Mine! Mine! Help! Well, a highly personal view there of the Falklands conflict, not one I confess that I really share. Well, let's now brighten things up a bit, shall we? Because after a summer break, it's the return of our weekly look at the world of rock and pop with Lee Peck. This time around, would you believe, it's called Popeye keeping an eye on pop, you might say. As Lee's just been over to America, he's taken a tongue-in-cheek look at music stateside, to use the vernacular. I think you'll see what I mean. Hey, it's brash, it's noisy, and there's people everywhere. And that's only the flight over. I am, of course, talking about America. This is the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. And I thought you'd like to see what's giving them the buzz over here at the moment. Before I get into that, let me first of all reveal to you an exclusive prime time showing, that's what they call it over here, of the best in British, Queen with Hammer to Fall. Is that over the top or is that over the top? Right to America. This is Manhattan, taken from Brooklyn Heights. Pretty good, eh? I've got three tunes coming up which are massive over here and should do well in the UK. First, Peter Wolf, the former frontman with the Jay Giles band, remember Centerfold? He's gone solo with Lights Out. That's my favourite, Peter Wolf. He's a good mate of Mick Jagger. And talking of the Stones, they've got a new video coming out in November. It's called Rewind after their latest compilation album and features live footage and interviews as well as videos of some of their greatest hits. I saw a sneak preview last night and not only is the music ace as you'd expect but the way it's been put together is very original. I won't say any more, save two of you can be the first to win one in a special competition in Popeye in the next couple of weeks. So, back to the US of A, the cars who've only had moderate success in the UK have scored a top ten hit over here with Drive. It comes out in the UK tomorrow, but will you buy it? The massive monster in the States at the moment is Prince, despite him being only five foot four inches tall. I'll have his latest after the gig died. Phase two, or even gig guide, phase two are at the bat and ball in Canterbury tonight. Tomorrow, the underrated Chris Rear can be seen at Bryan Pavilion. In Southampton on Saturday, the choice are playing the Joiner's Arms in St Mary Street. Sample Rogue Folk with the Explorers Club. They're at the Golden Arrow in Cheriton. And on Sunday, there's Pop Rock from the Gary Dean Band. They're at the Black Horse in Monks Horton. So I've saved the biggest until last Prince who in America is giving even Michael Jackson a run for his money. But unlike Jackson's clean living image, Prince is about sexuality and aggression. I'll leave you with the title track of his latest album and film, which is now a single in the UK. It's out tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Prince with Purple Rain. See ya. 
quote Lee, Prince is about sexuality and aggression. I don't believe it. Here's a man who's about the weather, Trevor Baker. Now, the weather's still a bit changeable, and there's going to be some rain uh, later this evening and during tonight, and perhaps some rain at times tomorrow, which will be a pretty cloudy day, and it'll be cooler than today. Saturday, though, it looks like being a pleasantly uh, dry and quite sunny day. Uh, here's the chart now with a cold front over the Irish Sea moving eastwards. That has some rain ahead of it, which will come through tonight, and there are some outbreaks of rain or showers behind it. Now, before I go on with this forecast, I'm going to take you across the Atlantic, not to see Lee Peck, but to see a satellite picture from an American satellite, uh, which shows the Hurricane Diana, which is now approaching North Carolina. In fact, it's over North Carolina. There's that swirl of white cloud there, which probably extends to about 50,000 feet. Uh, that's the east coast of the United States, and there's Florida there. And an interesting thing is that that is the that edge shows you the curvature of the Earth. Anyway, we're not going to be afflicted by any uh, hurricanes in this country. Here's the cold frontal cloud, which is going to give us tonight's rain. That's going to move eastwards away. A little break there over Western Ireland, come across uh, tomorrow morning, and then more cloud from the Atlantic. Here's the forecast chart for noon tomorrow. And by then, the winds will have turned northwesterly over most of the country, and there'll be showers about in many parts, but also some sunshine, though it'll be pretty cloudy in most parts at the start of the day. Sea crossings will be choppy. Now the forecast for the south in more detail. Lowest temperatures tonight will be about 12 degrees centigrade, 54 Fahrenheit, but top temperatures tomorrow only 17.